All right, in this week's episode, we are headed to Minnesota to visit with none other than Jeff Sturgis. He just finished remodeling his new home. You get to check out some of the bucks he's killed from over the years, hear some of his favorite stories. You guys are gonna love it, so here we go. Hey guys, I'm Jeff Sturgis from Whitetail Habitat Solutions, and uh, this is my deer home. This is kind of uh, kind of cool to have you guys along. Uh, you know, we've been waiting on finishing this home for a long time. I think July will be uh, a year. So we're coming up on just a couple weeks away. It'll be a year that's been working on it. And uh, we built this home here and there's so much we do here from shooting videos, shipping out all our books, web class material, workbooks, hats, all that kind of stuff. And, and then of course sheds, you know, right here. So we. We actually shed hunted a lot this year. We normally don't, but we have food plots everywhere here. It's a big hunting property. Starting with this right here, sofa table. What sofa table isn't complete without a bunch of sheds from this year? And it's cool, we had some nice bucks coming in late, so this is a super heavy buck. Neighbor had pictures of him, and uh, he should be around this year. And it's crazy, some of these bucks, some of the ones that don't score the highest end up being the ones that live the longest around here. So lots of sizes, shapes, and but really what we do on, a, on almost a weekly basis is I film with Dylan Lenz and uh, he's my videographer editor and we shoot a lot of videos inside, let alone all the web classes. I think we've shot uh, roughly 50 web classes in the last two years, at least videos for two web classes. So most of those are done inside, a lot of them, but come back here because we finally have a studio. We had a corner of the basement before, which was cool, we liked it. It was a nice private area, but this, we're still, it's still shaping up, but um, we have a hunting locker and we're kind of, you know, we've been here about a year, but we're still almost moving in, in effect. So this is kind of where we shoot a lot of our videos. We still have some sound panels to get on the ceiling. And this is kind of cool. I just noticed uh, we have this, this is in our basement, but this goes back to, this is the March issue, 2004 Quality Whitetails Magazine for the QDMA, and this is my first article that I published with them. So that's going back a long ways. It's, I kind of started the journey with working with people and developing habitats, and you can see this is a property, new food plots, location, and small acreage, big rewards, and we're kind of still on that same topic today. This is kind of our shoulder mountain, dead deer room right here. And it's, you know, again, memories. We can even look over here, Diane, this is Diane's first buck right here on the wall. This was one we were after for a few years, local legend, split brow buck, and she was able to get him during deer season, during the gun season. These right here, it just ended up this way, the way you put them on the wall. But uh, this one, right along this row right here, you know, some of the bigger ones, but in this one up here, those are all bow bucks. And, you know, I, I don't mind shooting them with any weapon. I, you know, rifle, shotgun, muzzle loader. I shot two last year with a muzzle loader and then one with a bow, uh, two with a bow. So I don't know, the bow bucks, they all, they're all special to me, but the bow bucks are something that uh, I really put to heart. And that being said, we could go through some of these bucks here and it's hard because I talked to the guys here a little bit and you know, what's, what's your favorite buck? What's your favorite story? And you start looking at them and staring at them and it's like, man, a lot of these bucks I hunted for years or we knew about them for years. We got pictures up for, for several years and uh, you start to almost get to know their personality, especially where their territory is, who else has seen them in the area as far as other hunters, friends you're sharing photos with. and. It's hard to pick favorites sometimes, it really is. It, it's very difficult, but I, out of all these right here, there's two I'll point out right away. This one right here was, it was a big buck. We saw a sign in the UP on public land, and it was an area I walked in 45 minutes, tried to get away from other people. On opening day, my sons were sitting with me, and Dante pointed out this big buck at one o'clock in the afternoon, 
slipping through the brush. We were back in a spruce swamp and, and I didn't see it. He just said it was big. And I, I think he was 11 at the time, 11, 10, something like that. So my boys were back there with me and they're literally, I was dragging them back there. They're nine and 10, 11 opening day, sit all day and they're taking naps and we're having fun. Well, I think it was two days later and I was coming down to Wisconsin to hunt for the opener. And I don't want to miss that. And I was just tired out from the season. And Diane told me to get out of bed and, uh, and go hunting. There's that big buck out there. And so I ah, <laughs> made it and went out there. And sure enough, he came through at about 10 o'clock. But for public land in the UP of Michigan, out in the middle of nowhere, there's just dozens of bait piles in the area, a lot of hunting pressure. On the outskirts, I get into those swamps in the middle. I hunt the spruce lines and funnels and uh, shot them at 35, 40 yards right in front of me, coming to me. And then going over here, I don't, maybe it's my competitive nature, but this buck over here was one I was after for a couple years, and I'd say six years old. But um, he was one I shot the ninth day of gun season with my bow in, in Wisconsin. That's the last day of gun season in, in Wisconsin's regular gun season. And went out and shot him with a bow, and that's something special to me, kind of like, you know, I want to get that buck. I know I'll get burned someday by hunting uh, with a, with a, I'd say maybe last year, I might've gotten burned a little bit hunting with a bow during gun season. But um, bottom line is that there's something special about shooting them with a bow. And, and uh, although I'm happy to shoot them with anything, you know, some of these, this was, uh, I have a kid's book out called Turn Tine and the Poachers. And you can see this inside tine on this buck right here. And he was one that was around, it was, we were new on the property and we didn't have a lot of history other than the people in the in local industrial park were watching him every day come off our property. So knew he was around. He went by me right before shooting hours at 10 o'clock or 10 minutes before shooting light. And I could see him go by. I thought it might be him, but it was too early to shoot. He went up, went around the rim and just cruising for does. And that's what they do. They'll go up to the top of the hollow or 300 feet in elevation down hunting with a bow. He went up and my buddy Carl missed him. And, uh, and missed him, and I heard this blowing way up on the ridge, just blowing, blowing, blowing of a deer. And it was, uh, Carl let me know on the radio, we check in every hour that he just missed a big buck. And I felt so bad for him until about a half hour later, I looked over and he was under my stand making a scrape a little ways away. So I stood up, shot him. He went maybe 50 yards at the most and piled up. Um, I basically yelled up to Carl. I was so excited. I waited for Carl to come down to me before walking up to him. And, you know, we both gave these big hugs like hunters do. And we walked up to him together and looked at him. And, uh, yeah, I felt a little bad that Carl missed him at that point. But <laughs> I have to admit it was kind of cool to get him. So I would have been very happy for him to shoot it. But uh, this was a buck that disappeared for a long time. Um, we saw him once the season before. We saw him. Two years earlier, we thought he was three. Beautiful buck. That fourth year, we saw him during the summer, and he was gone all hunting season, except we were going over to friends' cabins nearby. And he ran by uh, probably 8 o'clock at night in the dark, and that's that buck. And we had missed him the whole year. Well, then that next year, we had lots of summer pictures of him. And I think he was just a super shy buck, and that's how some of these bucks get older is there were two bucks fighting out in the field. It was a cold front, and I believe it was October 23rd or 22nd, right around there. And big cold front went through. I'm a big cold front hunter. Almost all of these bucks that are bow bucks were shot on cold fronts, high value days. And that's one of my books, All Weather White Tales. I talk about how to hunt in, in the weather. And that one came through. It was just during that time of pre-rut. There's two monsters fighting out in the field. And I would say that one of them... Eventually, it was 184 the following year. He was big that year, 170. And then there's another good one. He, at the time, was probably bigger than both of them, antler-wise, big body. But uh, he was slipping away. So instead of running towards the fight, he was sneaking away from the fight. And he was going towards where we saw him the gun season before that one time. So I think he was kind of going back to his fall home. And uh, he was going by. I was by a water hole. He slipped right through by that water hole. And I shot him before he had a chance to take a drink. But to me, it was kind of exiting, getting out of there. And, and again, that's why some of these bucks get so big is they're just super shy. So this one, this one's smaller. I put him on a European mount. He was a special one back in 2012 just because he was a nice bow buck from Michigan. And so, 
you know, some of those were it's high pressure. People say, you know, you've shot multiple giant bucks in this state or that state, and it's all relative to me. So some of those states, you know, Michigan's had over 425,000 bull hunters at one time. Iowa has 65,000. Uh, Kansas has had 25,000 bull hunters. Kentucky has a couple hundred thousand for bull hunters and gun hunters combined. So when you get into these high pressure states, people wonder why I travel to Pennsylvania to hunt public land every year. And it's, I've hunted out there. I've, uh, I think I've hunted 20 seasons altogether out there in Pennsylvania. And I still drive. I missed it last year. I went out to hunt the hunting public challenge and hunted with those guys during bow, but I really missed going back to gun season. People, I have friends around here, they don't understand why I drive that far to shoot small bucks. But again, it's, you get used to the area, you love the land, you love the lay of the land, and uh, it's hard not to go back. I missed it last year a lot. I missed those hills. I first hunted there in 93, and I still hunt in the same areas, the same point, saddles, draws, over about a three-by-three three mile area. Don't see a lot of bucks. Um, the biggest bucks I've shot in there have been in the 130s which out there is a monster. You know, these are, uh, just trying to think this one. This one was a uh, bow buck in Wisconsin, or uh, Kentucky. So it's a Kentucky bow buck, and then this was a gun, gun buck um, in Wisconsin, but good for decoration too. And, you know, this one was new property. We had lost an old lease that we had for 12 years. And so that first year hunted really hard, and this was my first mature buck on that. And we actually had history of them because we were hunting the neighboring property. So to walk up to this and be able to get him with a gun, it was towards the end of the gun season um, around Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is the second uh, weekend of Wisconsin's guns. So to know this was a mature buck and walk up on him and feel good about that, you know, you lost the leash, you gained the lease, and uh, it's kind of like, you know, it was a very, very good feeling um, to very satisfying um, at that point to shoot that one. And that's why, you know, they're not always measured in size, the, the favorite ones. And uh, I'll finish with a story right here. This is a, this is a cool 13-point right here. Now, I've got to add about this one too, but this 13-point, I'd shot a buck the year before, and that buck was very aggressive, and there was a hot doe. I tried sneaking up, up, up on him in the morning. It was frosty. I took my boots off. They were down in a draw with a doe, and this buck right here, which was much older, uh, six, seven years old, he was pushing this buck through the brush sideways and just he'd make a bunch of rubs. And that was interesting too because we make mock scrapes and they're on all our videos, the vertical vines, and they come in and hit them. We don't put any scent on them. And, uh, and they hit them over and over and over again where that buck made 20 rubs there just out of anger, probably never revisited those rubs. Well, I know he didn't because I shot him in the afternoon, but I mean, he probably would have never revisited those a horse pasture off to the side and he was just thrashing around. He was mad. And so I tried sneaking up on him, got to like 40 yards away, thought they were gone, stood up and they, they ran. So it's, I don't try stalking very often because that's a lot of times what happens with a bow. So shot that buck. Well, fast forward to the next year, here's this buck living in the same area. And he was really aggressive, maybe because he, because he was getting beat up all the time by the other one. Um, I actually snort wheezed him in. He came in snort wheezing. He, um, he thrashed a bunch of trees against the fence. You could hear the whole fence moving. And he came in and walked right under me, and it was after dark. So he kept coming in. It took him a long time. He just kept making rubs and scrapes all the way in, thinking another buck's there. And so kind of dejected. You know, it was after. Um, it was early November. And I went all the way down the tree, lowered my bow, got down there, as soon as I broke a branch on the bottom, he snort wheezed at me. And he'd, he'd been 20 yards away the whole time. Shined my light over there because I was a little bit, it was almost uh, scary at that point. And uh, I think it was 2004, somewhere in there. And he, and he ran away and I thought, I couldn't believe he was right there waiting for me almost, which was kind of weird. Well, the next morning where I knew his bedding area was, we had a, stand, a couple stands back there. We called it the two acre field. And that was about 500 yards away. And these are the only places we'd really gotten pictures of him for the last couple of years. So I went back in there in the morning early, going through the field. It was all goldenrod and some mixed old white pine. And uh, they, I heard running at me and then snort wheezes. It's one of those just instinctively. I grab an arrow and it's before light. And I never even had time to put it on my string or anything. I was looking at self-defense and he got to, for me in the camera, and 
he just uh, stopped and just kind of slunk away. And it was that buck again. He was just so aggressive. And those aggressive ones die early. You know, he made it to four years old, five at the most. Three hours later, I ended up shooting him. He was coming through on does. He was hurting those does. They were his. I'd gone about 100 yards, and he didn't care about seeing me in the morning or smelling me. He didn't even know what I was. He was just being aggressive, but ended up uh, shooting him. So pretty cool, though. That's the only time that I've ever been charged by a deer, and it's both been by the same deer night. And then the next day, he was just one of those deer that I, I think, you know, sometimes you get one that's killed like that out that's six, seven, eight years old. And... um and then this other buck pops up because he's being suppressed by that when he becomes aggressive. And if you have aggressive bucks, they die young, unlike this tall one over there that was super shy, running the other way from a fight. You know, they normally live a little bit longer. Just got lucky that he, he went by me. This one was a really cool buck that we filed for three years. And this is an example. A lot of these bucks are non-core bucks. And what I mean by that is those bucks are not on your land. They live somewhere else. And for three years, we had pictures of him. And I want to say it was 10 pictures in three years. And enough to know he's there. He's coming through consistently, but he's coming through only during the rut. And we have a few off-season pictures of him. Off-season meaning August, September, in the middle of the night. Enough to tell you that he lives somewhere else. Well, we find out where he lives. And I set up on him an opening day with the thought that we'd set up in a very thick area between ourselves and the neighbors. The neighbors would hunt across the draw, up the ridge. So really total land surface, seven, 800 yards. And straight as a crow flies, maybe a quarter mile. Well, about 10 o'clock, this buck comes in and starts feeding. And he works all the way around the hollow. I didn't have shots. I was sitting with my son, Jake, with a rifle. And Jake was supposed to be the shooter. And he's on my right side. And we're huddled in. It was one of those 10 degree, 20 mile an hour wind days. And we're, we have the wind coming from behind us above the ridge. What that does in the morning is it tails around, circles you and hits you in the face. So we're up in some rocks and we're watching this whole hollow. We had lots of does and fawns around us. And that buck kept feeding closer, closer, closer. It got to the point where Jake has the gun, the safety's off. He goes in a little depression that's only five, six feet deep. And Jake has the shot. He's sitting like this, looking right here, waiting for him to come up. And uh, just before he came up, a doe had worked its way uphill, feeding, started to blow. And I'm starting to panic. And the buck turned, went back up. He was behind a rock. His head was sticking out. Jake couldn't turn to his right in any way and see him. I grabbed the gun, safety's off, shot him right in the neck, dropped him. And Jake immediately kind of like, why'd you shoot my buck? He actually had tears in his eyes. And then we went up there. He was so happy that I got him. But Jake, if he's watching this right now, he'd say that's his buck. That's Jake's buck. So what's really cool, we got some great photos together. And, um, and, and the fun thing was is Jake shot a really nice buck the, uh, the next day sitting side by side. He shot a four-year-old that I'd passed up. And so that was one of those things. And Jake this isn't your buck. This is my buck. <laughs> so that being said, this is kind of cool. Um, we've been able to give this tour a few times to people, um, friends coming into the area and, uh, you know, YouTube channel, my YouTube channel and my website, social media. It is a community, a whitetail community. The hunting community is awesome. So to take you guys, I haven't even done this on my own channel. So I was waiting for Exodus to come here, and they finally fit me in. I don't know what it was. I, I don't know who was busier. I think maybe it was me at times, but um, it was great to have them come over here. But I really wanted to save this um, for Exodus and the Whitetail Cribs. I think it's a cool thing that they do. Um, but uh, great to have you along and bring you through a tour of my home and how we live, eat, breathe, work, sleep, whitetails, 365. It's a part of my full-time career, but it's also my passion and, and something I love to do. And I hope it comes through. We built a home around this, our pole building up here. We have a really nice archery range now. And so we really do live it, and I love bringing it to you guys. So I hope you really enjoy this episode of Whitetail Cribs and have enjoyed the tour of my home.